Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren en de Bali is zo'n plek. Hartelijk welkom allemaal naar deze reclameboodschap. Um, uh, herzlich willkommen. We würden deze avond in Englisch um, uh, uns verhalten, aber wir haben viele deutsche Gäste, also herzlich willkommen auch die deutsche Gäste. Um, I will continue in English. Um, very warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Juri Albrecht, I'm the director of the Bali and I'm supposed to lead this evening um, uh, in sort of a, a, a not too unruly waters. It's an experiment. Um, it's a wonderful experiment, I have to say. It's uh, we put this um, uh, working, this public working session together uh, with um, uh, the Goethe Institute, and um, it's um, it's actually the public part of what we, what a group of people have been doing all day, um, uh, which was working together with uh, Arbeit on uh, on Europa, Arbeitsgruppe on Europa. Um, uh, a few Germans who um, uh, uh, think about <laughs> the future of Europe and uh, want to be in conversation with um, uh, people from their age in other countries. And we um, uh, facilitated that and I have been listening in to a few of the, to uh, not to the whole day, but uh, a part of the day. And I have to say it was very uh, uh, interesting to see how uh, people who are all the same age, around 30, um, a debate on uh, uh, things on Europe and ideas on Europe and the future of Europe, uh, more specific. Um, uh, we, um, this is the public part of it, and in that respect, it's sort of a public working session, because people who've been talking to each other uh, in a Socratic way for the whole day uh, are here now uh, asked to uh, debate uh, things like the, the European elite and the future of the, of the responsibility of younger intellectuals on the European debate. And I, um, it's, it's, it's funny, actually, to, because I'm part of another generation, I'm 52, and it's very, um, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that, because um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm uh, more than 20 years older than most of the participants of tonight. Um, I think that my generation by now sort of is in power, but um, they make a very, um, they do a very bad job at that, if, I'm con if I may say so. So I'm interested in ideas of other generations, how they look upon that. Um, I would think that you know all the blame is always on the, the baby boom generation, um, but by now they're sort of fading out, and by now it's you know the people who are in the early 50s who are um, ruling the continent, and what are they doing actually? You wonder if they're really awake or not, or they're even there sometimes. Um, and that reminds me of Julien Benda. I don't know whether you know the French philosopher and writer uh, of La Trahison des Clercs, who wrote a wonderful book. Um, uh, about the, the 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 treason of the clerks and the clerks in his in his vocabulary are the intellectuals and the people who hold the pen, the treason in you know in the 20s and 30s, uh, the treason of democracy actually because by not defending it, and I always thought that it was a very very inspiring book and I'm an historian and I always thought that it was a book you know out of the the the, the dark part of the 20th century which you know we have overcome but actually if you read Julian Benda now and I did recently. It's a very inspiring book on, you know, the plight of the intellectuals and the duty of the intellectuals. Um, we have actually, uh, we have actually a writer now in Europe, Alessandro Barico, who just published a wonderful book booklet on, you know, the, our times. And one of the uh, the first chapter actually was published in the Groen Amsterdam not too long ago. It's a wonderful essay on, you know, the elites and the responsibility of the elites and what went wrong. But um, we have here an excellent group of of people. Um, who have been talking, like I said, all day. And um, I will introduce uh, uh, them later to you by the time we get to, uh, to a discussion. 
or to a talk, and, and you're very welcome to participate in that. Uh, but first, I want to uh, introduce to you Simon Strauss, who's been here yesterday in a totally different role uh, as novelist, um, discussing his novel with um, Connie Ballman in a talk with mm -hmm. Connie Ballman. But tonight, he's here as one of the initiative, <laughs> one of the uh, people who took the initiative for uh, Arbeit an Europa, and um, he's going to talk on the topic of tonight: um, elites and the future of, of, of the European project and our responsibilities in that, and report a little bit on Arbeit on Europa and what we've been talking about today with some of the discussions later tonight. Um, Simon Sal, thank you very much for coming over, and I give you the floor, and, um, and we continue after that. Yeah, good evening. How do we want this year to be remembered? 2019, as the moment the European idea was overthrown and shouted down with hate speech against the EU? Or 2019 as the starting point of a new wave of championing Europe as a vibrantly melting pot of intellectual debate? I hope this evening uh, will give an answer to this question, and um, I'm very happy to uh, be able to, uh, to, to say a couple of words before we have um, um, a debate on, um, on, the, on the question of today. But I welcome you um, in the name of uh, this initiative. You already um, um, introduced it, Working on Europe. Working on Europe is an initiative which was founded in the spring um, of 2017 after the Brexit vote by a group of um, young German-speaking European intellectuals or thinkers who joined together to form Arbeit an Europa, Working on Europe. Um, and the aim was and is, firstly, to organize think tank meetings um, every three months in European uh, regions away from the big capitals um, and focusing in these uh, talks, in these weekend talks, um, on central terms, keywords of intellectual um, European discourse. So we always focus on one um, one key word. So we had, for example, um, the concept of security, resistance, nation, religion, nature, all um, terms um, in which somehow um, are um, binding together uh, what is could be called a European um, questioning the European identity. And today we um, we focused on the um, keyword future. Um, so the um, intellectual discourse about these keywords is one part of these meetings. The other one is to experience the intercultural interaction with um, different young um, thinkers from these regions. And we had the pleasure today to, um, to meet four um, um, of them and have a, a discussion about possible um, 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 differences um, between national approaches towards the future concept or where we uh, agree on. So um, just briefly to say this is the one big column of our initiative. The other big column of our initiative, the other goal is um, of the project is um, um, a bigger project which is called European Archive of Voices, um, which is um, due to, to collect and ex uh, to collect experienced voices on the idea of Europe in the various countries of the European Union and to record them in sound and writing. So this is the uh, attempt uh, to try to collect um, a generation which is born between 1920 and 1940 um, and um, to ask them once more about their experiences um, in their lives, um, what, what Europe meant for them and their experiences on the European uh, landscape. And we try to collect that over the next two years um, and do a big um, uh, website and uh, exhibition project with that. So, um, and, and, and the intellectual impulses for these interviews are uh, coming from these meetings um, and one of them happened here today. And um, we were we're very happy to be um, to be hosted here in the Bali and sponsored generously by um, the Goethe Institute um, to make that happen. So this day, like I said, was the keyword future, and we had uh, pitches from very different contexts. I would say um, I can't summarize in any sense all the interesting and um, various um, topics we discussed, but um, I just wanted to briefly say that we started out by the question, by the general question, um, and how history looked at the future um, uh, as a concept. So we came together to, to the conclusion that history, in history, humans envisaged time uh, and and the future also. Uh, on the one hand, 
as a circle, so um, a, a general um, a repetition of uh, fall and decline, and then that this changed somehow briefly uh, where we where we would put the uh, word modernity around 1800, and then the future was open in the sense that um, people could imagine something which has not happened before to happen due to something like the French Revolution as an event which um, had huge uh, uh, left huge traces in the mentality and we then touched um, firstly on very very different questions in terms of um, what few what in what parts of our debate um, or our discourse future plays a role. And that started out by very practical um, questions about housing, for example. So rising uh, rising um, rents um, all over Europe um, bring people to the street. Um, and, and that is a huge future uh, fear people have that housing prices are so so high that they can't afford to live there anymore. We obviously touched on um, the, the area of technology as the main um, area of progress thinking, but also climate change, obviously, right um, in, in these uh, in these months and days uh, to see how this um, um, brings a lot of uh, other people also on the street in terms of um, preserving the climate for a better uh, future. So future is, that is what we came um, across, um, not only technology, but also trees. Um, the future thinking, uh, broadly speaking, changed obviously very much after 1989, so the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of, uh, uh, of socialism, and the end of ideology and ideals. And um, as Lawrence, uh, Lawrence um, uh, put it, uh, that after that, um, the future is based more on data and not so much more on ideals. So um, the, interesting, the interesting questions we, we, we then asked was how democracies, what, what is the role future plays in a democracy. So should democracies not just leave future open and only secure um, and preserve the basic political infra infrastructure so future could happen uh, later on. There was um, uh, some uh, opinions in the beginning that kind of changed during the day, um, but we, we, we came always back to the question how we can integrate the future thinking in our political discourse and how we combine it with democ democratic um, institutions. Um, we obviously touched on the rising um, criticism and even fear from institutions. Um, why are institutions such a target of hate at the moment? Uh, they're so boring. Why do they actually create so much anger? One, one of us asked, which is actually really an interesting question. Um, and then we came uh, to the questions, uh, the possibilities and dangers of European citizenship, if there's something we should strive for or not. And the need, obviously, of a, of a space for public debate to create something like a European citizen. Um, citizenship and um, and also the enormous um, importance of um, of, co of a coalition of institutions like something like the Bali, um, which has a, 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 the possibility to connect with other institutions, um, cultural institutions throughout Europe to strengthen uh, something like a European citizenship. Um, we also touched um, from a different angle on the aesthetics of politics. So. Um, uh, we had a very interesting talk about the um, uh, the obvious connection between uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio, an Italian poet, and Elon Musk, um, uh, who, who both of them uh, in somehow use future in their approaches um, uh, towards uh, towards the present um, uh, as a tool to kind of bring back the past. So in politics, future is the past. That was one of the arguments. Um, then we also had a very interesting input um, discussing um, the question I rose in the beginning. So isn't future or the thinking of future should lead us to a future history? So we should, shouldn't we ask ourselves the question, is this how we act today, the way we want to be remembered in the future? Um, as a, maybe a starting point of a, uh, of a political speech, wouldn't that be a good political question in the beginning how to, to envisage how uh, someone will look back on us? And then obviously we had an interesting, um, lively debate on the question how um, the necessity of combining strengthening minority rights and minorities in general and the social, the rise of the social question again. So what could be there um, a kind of harmonization of these um, different approaches towards um, making the present better. And in the end, we um, also again came back to the questions how to represent the future in democracies and um, in to, to strengthen intergenerational uh, rights. And there was a proposition of of, um, to establish a future chamber um, where laws are tested by imagined future, we can, could care. So we talked a lot, a lot about a lot, and we talked about um, 
for example, also very practical measures um, like a European representative. Um, how can we get the national debate more focused on European issues? So maybe a Euro European representative in every national parliament could be a way, or the other way around, inviting um, national representatives more often to the European debates so we can focus more on European questions in the public. Um, but we also, and I come now to the um, topic of our evening, we also ask ourselves what our all own role could be, and obviously we uh, all agreed that we talk out of an elitist perspective on this, and um, how we could um, maybe counteract this, counteract this, and one of the propositions was, for example, to get union questions about the unions on board on this, and so we don't talk only from an elitist perspective, but think also um, about Europe, not only about a Europe of companies, but of workers, for example. So this is the moment I want to um, uh, come to, to our uh, uh, the topic of today, the intellectual elite, questioning the European intellectual Lead. Um, obviously, it's a big title, um, but for tonight, we are the intellectual elite, and we who sit here have to defend ourselves. And I, I think this is really an interesting moment, because obviously, we all experience at the moment um, that intellectualism and elite uh, thinking comes under enormous pressure from different uh, perspectives. No? I mean, the, the populist movements have a target, and they are the intellectuals and the elite. Um, they, they pretend, the populists pretend, to speak for the real people against the elite who was um, just um, looking for interests um, which don't have anything to do with the real people. So with the people who stand in the rain where, where the elite is bathing in the sun. I would say, to come to an end, I would say this is first, obviously it's a shocking and shaking moment uh, to see in public and in discourse um, to, to kind of a return of a derogative and denouncing the intellectual and the elite, because obviously that reminds us on very dark periods of uh, um, European history when this was uh, already already the case. So um, it's obviously a shocking moment when you see people using um, uh, uh, Twitter and hate speech to um, to to call down and shout down um, intellectuals. So that means complex thinking. But on the other hand, it's also I would say a very very interesting start starting point, and it's a good thing maybe even, that it's, um, f it's challenging us uh, as an intellectual, young intellectual um, um, elite to prove, to really prove that we have something to say and that we are in a responsible and an important, that we play a responsible and important part in the European discourse. So that we are not only fact checkers and not only experts, but we also have um, something to say and that we can be, um, uh, in a way, act as gatekeepers of liberal values and the tradition of complex thinking. Um, and this is something this evening wants to persuade you all of, that we, um, as, uh, as we gather here and we try to get the, the discourse, the intellectual public debate running, that we do something for the European thinking. Thank you very much for coming and let's have a good debate tonight. If you can stay there for one moment, I have just a, a two, two questions, maybe a, a very sh short ones before we uh, uh, move off into the panels and you g com come back uh, on them as well. But um, uh, just, to, just to be clear, um, because you are one of the founders on Arbeit uh, on Europa, um, um, you say uh, we can be gatekeepers, we uh, 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 intellectuals, uh, maybe public intellectuals of around 30, um, um, which um, is true, but do you think you can also be shapers of that future, of the idea of the future of? Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope so, but obviously that's a question of power and the power of, um, I mean, we we founded the association not mainly to gain power first, but to really reassure ourselves about what is Europe. You know, we, we founded it, like I said, after the Brexit vote, where everyone said, oh no, what is happening? And then we said, okay, what do we actually defend here? Do we defend the uh, the market? Is it that what we defend? Or is it something else? Is there is there something uh, maybe more complex, more problematic, like a European cultural identity? And so I would say for us, this, this association has the aim first and foremost to work on these questions and to get uh, a certain understanding and obviously in the long run um, establish um, a, a way of thinking and even talking about Europe, which is not seen at the moment. So obviously at the moment we see a huge um, uh, 
uh, a huge um, disproportion and hierarchy of uh, political and economic talk about Europe and not cultural talk. And this is where we want to, we want to jump in, basically. Yeah, but it's a question of power, of course, if you want to implement ideas. But um, I think it's, uh, uh, it's Balzac who said nothing is more powerful than an idea which time has come because no army in the world is powerful enough to stop, to stop it. Um, it just takes an idea, doesn't it? Yeah, that's for sure. And I mean, sometimes it's, it's the, the ideas could have a bigger political impact, I think, if they don't, in the beginning, think of themselves as being political. You know, so ideas could be developed through um, a cultural sphere and then maybe obviously have at some point in a political aspect. Um, but I mean, yeah, the, we see a lot of political engagement at the moment. The Pulse of Europe um, um, Association, which is very strong in Germany as well, does a lot of this, brings people to the street and, and, and co proclaims a, a pro-European um, uh, agenda. But I'm sometimes, I don't really know if they have really thought through what they defend, you know, and, 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 and more than just the conservative um, approach to let everything as it is, you know, and, um, and we want to try to, to, to get a little bit deeper and, um, and we are all not, um, we don't all agree on our political um, uh, opinions, we have different political opinions, but we, we share the, the interest in the question of uh, working on Europe and what that could be. So you're saying um, just defending the the economic union of the 90s and early 20, uh, 21st century uh, is probably not enough. Yeah, I think this is not enough to, to really have a future thinking of, of, of the European idea, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, explaining a little bit further. Um, um, just to, to kick off this, 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 this evening, um, I, um, um, I want to um, introduce a few other speakers of tonight. Um, and I'm I have it here, and they're on the first row and second row here. Um, uh, first, I'd like to introduce Tom Muller. Um, he is a German publicist and author, writer. He's uh, working on his first uh, novel at the moment, which will be uh, out in the spring, I believe, in the, in the autumn, I believe, I hope. Um, and um, he's also the director of publishing house uh, Tropen in Berlin. Very warm welcome to you. Are you, are you working on your first novel, indeed? Um, actually, yeah, it's almost finished. Next it's week. almost finished. Uh, so you go to the other side, from being a publisher to being published. Yeah, you could say so, but yeah, I remain a publisher as well, so yeah. Um, yeah, I have to, to play um, with both legs. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you're a participant and a founder of this group, uh, Arbeit an Europa, as well, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah, not, not yeah. a founder, but I'm a, I'm a member. A participant, of an active participant. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you um, uh, for being here. I'd like to introduce Kiza Magandan, uh, uh, a well-known guest, actually, uh, in the Bali. Uh, who is uh, a writer, writer on, uh, uh, on um, migration, politics, identity, policy of identity, and the relationship between Africa and the world. Also, he has roots in Congo and uh, is working on a book at this moment. Um, I think it has, um, uh, it has to do with how to, be, how to be a Dutchman, isn't it? Yes, my attempt to become a Dutch citizen. <laughs> yeah, when, will, when will it be, be out? Uh, so I'm finishing it this summer, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it depends on how the publisher will edit. Mm -hmm. So hopefully somewhere next year. And is, is there a part of being Dutchman as being European? Well. <laughs> That's um, a big question. Huh? <laughs> so you, it depends on which side of Europe. It's the, if it's the financial aspect, mm -hmm. then yes, we are European. So when it comes to the cultural Europe, then it can be debated to which extent Europeness and Dutchness are intertwined. Mm -hmm. It can be debated. What would you be inclined to, to, to I would say to? the Netherlands different than Greece, uh, culturally. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that. So you can be, some people feel that they are from Amsterdam, uh, from us, and not necessarily European. Yeah. Uh, some other people, as we've seen in elections, feel more Dutch than European, and uh, as we are debating and even have an aversion towards uh, Europe. But I've been uh, listening to uh, some of your columns and uh, debates you've been doing here. I suppose you see yourself uh, not entirely as um, uh, uh, linked to only to this city. Mm. So in your case, because it's also a personal uh, a book, of course, in mm. your case, would you say it's more international? It's more also German and European and Greek? Or is that, or would it be more Congolese and Dutch? My identity. Yeah, if you if you becoming a Dutchman, would you in the same time becoming become a European by incorporating 
the Dutchness? So I used to call culture? myself Afropean, um, a pan mm -hmm. Afropean actually. I have friends who call themselves Afropean mm -hmm. because of the connection between Africa and Europe. And as a city, of course, with discomforts uh, like European elites. I lived 12 years in the Netherlands. I was a refugee and I just came from Italy and speak with these people who are pursuing the European dream that I actually live. I was in Rome, I uh, ordered the Uber and the Uber guy came and he saw three black people and he, he decided to uh, cancel the trip. So that's the Europe. At the start of the trip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I had all the money and I was uh, well looked in my suits, but somehow uh, he decided to cancel the trip, and I think... He didn't perceive you as European, probably. No, I think I, if in his eyes, I was one of those African, and he saw danger, and uh, we can debate, because there are also negative aspect on migration. Mm -hmm. But as I sit here, I think that's my first impression, like my relationship, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily f out of love. So, but it's a, it's a battle with, with uh, these uh, pan-European ideas, that in itself has very contradictive uh, connotations. On one hand, it's a soft power that we received the Nobel Pr Prize of Peace, I think, in 2013. Mm. And it was more from a cultural uh, aspect, eh? post-war peace. But if you look at the real, real political reality of Europe and how we externalize our borders and letting Sudan and uh, which other problematic country, Libya, that are now in term or manage our mi migration, then I think Europe has a very serious problem. And that Europe, I have an ambivalent relationship with. And I think we should also discuss that, like how Europe is related to its neighbor that are in, in security. And are we really able to manage this migration flow if we cannot think about uh, um, international solidarity? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and when is the book coming out? You hope? Hopefully next year. But it will be more on my attempt to become Dutch, not necessarily European. No, no, I understand, but yeah. just <laughs> ask a little bit on the, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, Laurens Dassen, um, who is um, the president of Volt Nederland, uh, Volt the Netherlands, and that's part of the European movement Volt Europe. Um, you, you joined somewhere last year, in February, I think, um, of last year, and you became the, the founder of the Dutch chapter of uh, Volt movement. In the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, yeah, the Dutch, yeah, exactly. And, um, uh, you worked in the financial sector in uh, Amsterdam and Dubai, I understand. And um, uh, but now it's a full-time job. The the, the vault, the president being president of the vault. Uh, definitely. Uh, so we founded the uh, Vault Netherlands in uh, June last year, uh, and from that time onwards, uh, we saw the vault uh, grew, grew. Uh, but we were still an organization without financial means. Uh, and then we thought, okay, how are we going to do this? Uh, because no money is no people, no people, no money. Um, and then we just debated it and we thought, okay, we really believe in this idea of ensuring that politics is not only on a national level, but it is also uh, that we do it on a European level. And uh, we truly believe in this European idea of having a European political party. Uh, so together with Rainier uh, van Landschot, uh, we decided to quit our jobs in September. Uh, to further build on the organization, and we still do that as uh, still as volunteers also. Um, but in, uh, of course, we have grown further, and our ambition is to participate in the European elections this year uh, to get the two seats in the Netherlands, 25 uh, across Europe. Um, and uh, for now, we are with uh, 12 to 14 uh, full-time volunteers uh, within the Netherlands only. So I think that's really uh, amazing that so many young people spend such a great amount of time on something they believe in and really to also take up the responsibility in bringing uh, Europe a step further, at least in a political sense. So you quit your job in the financial sector to become a volunteer for a political party which doesn't exist and is pan-European. <laughs> exactly. Okay, that's just, and, um, um, now just to, to be clear about this, and, um, and it, that's what it is. It is a political movement and a political party all over Europe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, Volt Europa was founded uh, as uh, Arbeid an Europa after Brexit, mm -hmm. um, because uh, three people, a, a French girl, a German guy and an Italian guy said, how is it possible that this is happening at the moment in this phase, uh, this time of period? Uh, and why is no one standing up? There were some protests, there were some uh, shaking of shoulders, uh, but nothing really changed. And also from a political side, nothing really changed. And they said, uh, we do not let this happen. Uh, then they looked at, okay, what do they think is wrong at the moment? And they said, okay, 
We have uh, issues that are uh, global issues like climate change, social inequality, the future of work, uh, but we still have a political spectrum which is uh, national oriented and we need to change that. We want to form a European party. Uh, we are present in all the 28 member states. Uh, we're going to run uh, for the elections in at least seven countries. Uh, we hoped to have a little bit more, but uh, there are some barriers in some countries which make it very uh, difficult to participate. Uh, but at least in seven, so uh, um, and we want to form also our own political family within the European Party. So um, you found out that um, uh, some democratic parts of the democratic European Union are not as democratic as you thought. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And that was a real eye-opener, and I think uh, even diving in further uh, during the last year, you see that, for example, within the Netherlands, you have D66 and DVD who are in the same family, but no one knows about this. Uh, the same with uh, CDA, uh, who is uh, in the same family with uh, uh, Fides, uh, so the party of Viktor Orban, mm -hmm. um, which make the European Union a little bit intransparent. But also, um, European successes are claimed by national parties, and national failures are often uh, given away to, uh, to, to Brussels. Uh, so I think there's a lot to win still. Uh, okay. Um, um, so, um, uh, so the three of you actually think about, you know, uh, responsibilities and politics and state and and you know how far that goes and how much it's connected with identity or one political party or one movement or Dutchness or, but um, I want to just kick off a little, take one step back and um, um, what's um, wh what's not to like about Europe? Why why what's the what's the problem with it? And just just maybe looking at it from the other side, what's wrong with it? We had this question actually uh, during the day quite often and. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one because of it's what you found. You're 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 around thirty. It's what you found. You know all your life. But but I think the problem is that we all like, and that's what what populists use. Like everyone likes uh, to be European. I think, and the, the the diversity of European culture is praised. I think by most of uh, by the vast majority of mm -hmm. of Europeans. You think so? And then we have the problem that. Uh, you cannot feel the EU as an institution. And uh, this is maybe the, the target point. And I was uh, discussing with Lawrence uh, during the day uh, many times, what can you actually do? And uh, I think when you look what, what populists do, they, they occupy the emotional field, because, and, but they do it through hate. You know, they, uh, they try to create fear or they, they, they cry, try to, create, to, to fill the vacuum that the EU institution has left because it's so far away, or it feels so far away and so un untangible. And I think the, 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 we need more, um, yeah, more participation of our senses also, not only of our minds, of the EU as institution. And for instance, uh, the you day we, of vote... We, we, meet, we need more love. More what? More love. Yeah, yeah. We Where's the love? love. Yeah. And, and we need to, to feel the burn. Yeah, that's, that's and I would say, for instance, the, burn like the, the, the very day of voting, for instance. Yeah, what a great mm -hmm. achievement is it is to be uh, to to be able to go and put your vote out for such a vast territory as it is the European Union. But, so, but, would, so would you say that you know, question the European intellectual elite or the ones who built you know uh, uh, the union? And there were indeed you know uh, a few great intellectuals among them, the, especially French, but also German and Dutch, and, and so they they didn't put enough love in it, not enough, not enough patriotism. They didn't put enough possibility to, to uh, participate with love, with the institution. And let me finish this, um, I make it yes, very please, quick. Please. Yeah. Um, no, 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 don't worry, we have all the time the, in the world. The, so. the, 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 the day of voting, yeah, for instance, I always ask myself, why is no one celebrating this day? You know, it's such a, it's like, you have that every four years, but you don't really like it's this kind of responsibility. Yeah, you have to make sure that you are at home and that you do your kind of uh, uh, postal uh, uh, voting. But it's not never that you think, oh yeah, this is this great day where I'm going to put my vote and then we're gonna be all out on the streets and party just because we voted and because we have we have the possibility. We are not in China, for instance, where uh, you can vote but um, nothing happens. So enjoy in, uh, enjoy your rides and from Helsinki yeah, to Malta. Yeah, but this must be um, also encouraged by the institution like you know put it on a Wednesday make it a free not working day so that people think 
Yeah, man, it's cool. We go yeah. to vote because we don't have to work and we have the free afternoon and then we can meet up and discuss politics and just this one day on uh, every four Maybe years. Maybe even have a beer with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. why not? Yeah, yeah. Okay. why not yeah. like combine yeah. Yeah. positive aspects of it, which definitely there are many of them, but I think this is the, the, the only rational thinking is good to make good laws, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I don't uh, doubt that. But you need to, to have ideas that capture the heart. So, the, so those nationalists, they have all the fun, and we have all the brains, and uh, and, and and that's you know. Well, let's Isn't turn that sad? Yeah. Let's turn that around. Yeah, and their no. fun is the hate fun. What what <laughs> which is the worst you can have? So yeah, yeah we are all kind of fucked. Yeah. Okay. 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 That yeah 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 yeah. That it, 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 uh, it is very far away. It's very intellectual. Maybe it's, it's, in defense of Kizar? a nationalist. Yes. yes, please. Because um, we have to be aware of the fact. Maybe it is hate. But how I follow people like um, uh, the Fidesz party, they are doing it out of love. Mm -hmm. But it's love for the national state. Mm -hmm. So their moral stance is on another focus. So they don't want this technocratic European Union, which is already, you mentioned this, like the foundation, Europe as an elitist intellectual project. Sure. Yeah. So it is from above, uh, it's uh, bottom up, top down? Top down, yeah. yeah. So uh, how can you then uh, try, you can organize a party during the elections, and we all know these debates now, whether elections are the necessary means. So, so, you doubt, so, so Giza, you're doubting whether that would work? Because their love is at the so different. Love is indeed about solidarity. Mm -hmm. So, and when we talk about solidarity, it's about paying a price. Mm -hmm. And the way we organized, now I speak like a European, the way we organize European institutions <laughs> yeah, is not necessarily really fair eh, compared to Southern European countries. Yeah, because now we're coming to the part I'm also asking to you, you know, what's not to like? What's wrong with it? Why doesn't it... So then I think it is an equal distribution because Euro Europe is a financial project. And indeed, the elites tried a story, a common story, like after the war we need... Peace and yeah, prosperity. That was a story that unfortunately was shallow, I think, not in depth, not felt. Mm -hmm. And you see that among uh, the new generations, it's not filled. And even the older generation... As we have seen okay, with but, Brexit, but there, they forget there, that there, story. There you agree with Tom because you say it's shallow, it's not felt through, it's not really because felt. you cannot realize that you cannot force love. Okay. Mm -hmm. You cannot force people who are different. Let's be honest, Europe is quite diverse, which is part of its intellectual. No, this culture diversity is part of its uh, uh, rightdom, mm -hmm. richness, richness. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you should deal with that, with that that diversity. You cannot force one another to love, but you can learn how to be, uh, to, you can learn continental solidarity mm -hmm. by when we have financial crisis, yeah, to, uh, to have a shared burden of, especially countries like Germany and the Netherlands who benefit and the most from the European institutions mm -hmm. should reflect on uh, the continental uh, distribution of uh, because it's so a you, you say, you're saying it's, it's, it's an unequal distribution of wealth. It, the, the, it's designed in a way that it's unequal distributed. And that's exactly. a fundamental problem. And the paradox yeah. about what is to like, not to like about mm -hmm. Europe is that mm -hmm. they are the intellectual elites who are actually hated, the cultural elite, while it's actually the financial elites who are, have Europe in their hands. So in the most public debates, like also in the Netherlands, we had lately uh, uh, Thierry Baudet from Forum for Democracy, mm -hmm. we're talking about journalists, architects. Uh, so these people, they are intellectual elites, but actually you should tackle the global elites that mm -hmm. are also on the European level, who are uh, bank, bank, banking industries and, and so forth. So you're, so you're saying um, we should look at it, we should bundle all elites together, we're saying, yeah. you're saying, uh, there is a problem with the financial elite shaping the union, and it's not the cultural elite who's been attacked by some of the yeah. uh, populist or nationalists. But yeah. isn't it mm -hmm. both in a mm -hmm. sense? Because indeed, I mean, uh, Europe hasn't been working the same way for everyone, and uh, you see a big social inequality also between the north and the south, uh, but uh, also in different aspects. And I think until 1989, we had a very strong story uh, after the war, stable, uh, of, uh, stability, safety, mm -hmm. and also on the other side of the Iron Curtain, there was the communism and there was uh, the common 
enemy, of course, where we integrated Europe and what was based on the story. Yeah, but then, then the communism the came down and, exactly. and, then and our own story, end of story disappeared. Mm -hmm. But that is also where, when they uh, let market loose, and that's also when it was really about gaining wealth uh, for a lot of, well, elites or how, how you want to call them, and uh, it was not taking care of each other anymore. And I think that is also some uh, one of the problems that we have within the European Union. Yes, because the same question for you, which is maybe difficult, but what's not to like? You know, why... Because you're, you're stepping into the European endeavor, you might go to Brussels, but what's the problem there? You are from what the financial be, sector, what should you should know. Yeah. What's, what's the <laughs> well, that's also why I joined the financial sector, because I was uh, interested Because, in of course, I understand it's, it's interesting. But I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, we have not been able to move forward with the European Union as we should have. Uh, for example, we're still... Um, is this, yeah, is this better for everyone? There are people in, at home who listen uh, uh, on, the, on the internet, so for them it's very important that we speak in the microphone. That's right. No, no, but, um, so, so what is not to like is that, um, I mean, the way the European Union works at the moment is, is that it's completely intransparent. I mean, before I was uh, part of Volt, I also wasn't aware of what was going on. I wasn't even remembering of who am um, uh, I voting for. And I mean, we have a European Parliament, and the Parliament doesn't have the right uh, to initiative. So we vote on people to go to parliament for us, to represent yeah. us, and they are not even uh, able to propose laws, to propose new regulations. They don't so have the right of initiative. No, no, exactly. But the National Assembly in, uh, the Assemblée Nationale in Paris doesn't have that right as well. No, but we, we should have that because that is the representation But the French we want. not necessarily agree with that because they are fine, they think they're living in a great democracy. Well, they have a presidential democracy and mm -hmm. not a parliamentarian democracy. And I think that is uh, something that we should uh, strive for. And I think that, that is also something okay. that Volt, okay. uh, So you're involved. saying, but you're saying basically it's, it's intransparent and needs to be reformed. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And um, um, so we have severe criticism uh, here. We have, uh, there's uh, a lack of uh, a burn. Uh, there's, uh, it's in the hands of a financial uh, worldwide elite. But if I um, also and, may add, and, add one and, more thing. And we have an instance intransparent political system. And, and yeah. one more thing, yeah. because we also mentioned the cultural elite, and I mean, mm -hmm. um, there, there is the cultural elite, there's nothing what uh, happens with, for Europe. So, I mean, there are no songs about Europe. There are yeah. no, uh, I know, yeah, but Euro, I mean, obviously, Euro we, Festival, we also uh, discussed today uh, <laughs> the, the, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's true, but um, I mean, at the current, uh, and we have uh, limited uh, European news, we have uh, almost we have no Euro European news series, uh, no, but it's very limited, I mean. No European Netflix, no. No, exactly, but <laughs> yeah, I mean. Right. Yeah. We discussed that it's, as well tonight. Yeah. yeah, and it, it seems like a joke because, but it, well, honestly, it's, 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 it's I mean, it's a very serious very thing, important. the Brits are breaking away right now, it's not a joke, it's, you know, yeah, it's yeah, very exactly. serious. And, but <laughs> we look a lot at um, uh, American uh, series and American music and those kind of things, and for some odd reason, we find that very uh, fun and a lot of things, but it seems difficult for us to make that as Europeans happening and that we listen to... So that's another criticism. We don't have a, a European cultural elite. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we don't need that. Europe, uh, national, con national states have their cultural elite. And that's what makes Europe different than the United States, for instance. So you cannot create a cultural elite. Yeah? We have writers and journalists in the Netherlands, which is also the case in Germany. It's a rich culture, but it is very difficult to like, combine that and create one singer, oh, single but, European but you could, but you story. Could, you like Netflix is European, uh, sorry, Spotify is European. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's not European. No, it's, it's also from not saying that uh, so uh, you should abandon the national ones and you should only have the European one. It's 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 not uh, one or the other. I mm. think you should have both, and I think that is something that is missing at the moment. Mm. Okay, but um, um, uh, but so how can we to, create create to, a, that like an uh, European? That, to take that one one step further, because um, um, in these debates, it's always the populists who get the blame, of course, you know, because they're breaking away, they're hating, and they're they're all uh, all sort of. But um, a lot of the critique you just um, uh, between the three of you, you know, outed, um, is the same critique as Fidesz or Baudet or Le Pen makes. Yeah, true. Isn't it? True. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's why these parts are very interesting. But the question arises, though, uh, which part of the population mm -hmm. is uh, not satisfied? Because we also have to look at percentages. Maybe the structures of how our communication channels are organized are changed. Mm -hmm. That's why we have a feeling that a big majority is against Europe. So if you look at uh, national polls, uh, like in the Netherlands, yeah, we have a 
uh, huge ma people who support Europe. Mm -hmm. So, but then the question rises, even like what we are discussing today, mm -hmm. are we only looking at the 20% who are, might be the losers of this artificial intelligence society, as you may call it? Globalization, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or um, are you also looking at the 80% who Who's are benefiting? Yeah, mm -hmm. in a sense, pro Europe. So, and I think that uh, the populists in all countries. Uh, ma uh, manage to capitalize this 20%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, maybe their cultural uncertainty or financial uncertainty. Mm -hmm. But we should, uh, so it, you can have a critique on Europe mm -hmm. without like um, saying that we should ban the whole house. Oh, because the, so the, like we have part to say we should go out of the EU. Maybe it's not that wise, but you can criticize and mm -hmm. debate it from inside. Mm -hmm. I would ask also, like when we are criticizing the, the economic equality in the EU, and you were like mentioning uh, Hungary and the south, southern states, you should also question yourself where would the, these states be today without the European Union, without being into the Union? I mean, the south of Italy is a very, for instance, is a very difficult, also logistically and geographically very difficult territory because how do you get goods there? It's yeah, just it's a, a very bad hmm? position. Yeah. Hmm. And, uh, and this has been the case all the time. And tons of money from the EU, which is a good concept, have been going there and they have been going to Hungary, which mm. is so why Hungary is, is quite okay uh, today and which why they can love their good, great Hungary again with Orban. And, but then... But the love is made with money then, the burn that you are talking about. Yeah, it's the problem the is that the love supports. is not coming back to where the money comes from, but it's, go, it's taken by the nationalists like Viktor Orban, mm. who claims the success his, although the money and the, the market is uh, European, and that is a, is a big problem. So you would say, you would say um, um, instead of focusing on uh, which could be better, um, imagine where those places would have been without a European Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a good counter argument if you want to defend the uh, European Union. I think, and this is something we try to do today, mm -hmm. finding visionary aspects, talking about future, um, yeah. of where can we go and not trying to, like, repeating all the criticism, which is absolutely uh, understandable and in many aspects right, uh, that we've been hearing uh, for such a long time. And uh, I think this is something I personally sh share with the idea of Walt too, that uh, this is something we have to do as intellectuals, use imaginative power and try to do uh, interesting stuff that captivates uh, people and do it without saying EU is uh, bad and nations are good, but trying to do it in an in a inclusive approach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mm -hmm. I find it, to be honest, a mm -hmm. bit lazy because social democrats are doing it as well. They are saying, like, look at us. Without us, we wouldn't have this good social structure. But pe people don't care about what you have done in the past. So you can hypothesize what, uh, how kind of a mess this country will be without Europe. But that's not the problem. Would, would, you, would you agree with the argument, though? I mean, it's you an interesting say, argument, mm -hmm. and social democrats are using it mm -hmm. to say, look, you look what we've done for you. Yeah, yeah. The, but the, the, the PvdA and the Parti Socialista are exactly. saying that, you know, look where, how far we've come. Huh? Yeah, but people need a new story, and we, these people we call uh, populists okay. somehow provide a story. Mm -hmm. And if you think that you have a better story than mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. as, as you have, I, I think. Then you what's, should, what's you better should on the on the on the story of old? What's better? Yeah, his story is trying to be uh, trans transnational. Transnational, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, because it's results. strange that the Brit the the Dutch can vote on the association agreement with uh, uh, Ukraine, yeah. Ukraine, while people in Belgium cannot. Uh, but what I find uh, tricky is that uh, Belgium is being given as a uh, example of what the European Union could be. There, you have different parties. So you don't have to vote on another political party in a French-speaking part. So I find it really interesting that you are trying to go beyond the borders, which I think political participation is one of, uh, being a member of a political party is one of, it's one of the ways to create so a burn. So that's, 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 a, that's a new story. That's something different than the, the old ones tried to do. Is that right? Uh, well, one of the goals, that, of course, that we want to be is a grassroots movement and that we want to be also on a local level very active, also to indeed bring people back to the politics uh, and really uh, let them participate in the way politics is done. Um, so connecting the localized level also to the European level. So I think that's completely something different. And also the technologies that we use for that and the means that we have for that 
is different because I, I've been in, a member of uh, other parties as well, of other party, only one. Um, but um, uh, it was very difficult to contribute there because you have this strict hierarchy and uh, you have to be a member for a certain time or something like that. Um, and with Involved, we really try, okay, so you uh, uh, um, put yourself over, you want to become a member, then you get a phone call, how do you want to contribute, you get a warm welcome and people really get active on the, on the local level. And, and, and you participating in the next election, the end of May? Yeah. Uh, on a national level? On a national level. And you have the same um, uh, um, party program in every European member state you participate in. Yeah, so it's called the Amsterdam Declaration. It has been uh, developed by thousands of Europeans mm -hmm. uh, on uh, digital means, so uh, working on Google Docs uh, and those type of things, uh, discussing uh, on an uh, international platform. Uh, and really also voting upon it. Um, and there are some things uh, which are in there which, for example, on taxation, which for the Netherlands might be not uh, the most prominent thing uh, because, uh, well, we are still uh, kind of a tax haven. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that way, by making it as a European, it's also the European perspective first and not the national perspective. Would you say that um, if you, if you um, succeed, and would you believe that there's a European Demos? Uh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, what Volt tries to do is uh, being the first European parties, but I hope also others will follow. Mm. I mean, uh, Volt so you, shouldn't so be the only one. So you, you think you can construct a narrative in which the whole European people is participating in something, and by that being a demos? Because I heard a lot of people say that there can be no European democracy because um, there's no European demos. There's no European folk. There's no European people. But you would, you would. I would argue uh, differently because uh, I think, uh, and it's again, it's not uh, uh, you're, you're not uh, a Dutch person or you're a European. You can be both. You can be none. Uh, I feel I come. F I, I live in Amsterdam, but I come from the south of the Netherlands. I still feel a Brabander, uh, but I also feel sometimes European. Sometimes I feel I'm, I'm proud to be Dutch. So I mean, there, there shouldn't be any. Uh, uh, may, may I say just yes, add please? Yeah. one one more uh, small thing? I mean. If I'm um, uh, from Berlin, and if you if you experience that, then there's no other way than to say that there is a European demos in a way, at least in some some spaces. Of course, it's a very urban and it's urban center, and it's not mm. uh, everywhere. But the kind of mixture of of uh, Europeans you have present there that all are also mixing w among themselves all the time in all kind of cafes and and stuff is kind of a reality in like it's it's also in you can never like there is no going back i think um so that's why i think uh, there are some some germs that can where you can grow it i th i think in small places in italy and greece a lot of people in small places feel very european i mean not not all of them but some of, some do so it's mm. not not especially i would say uh, metropolitan but sorry Kisa, yeah, that to join aspect, yeah? but i also think that the european demos can be found in uh, academic conference rooms mm -hmm. uh, through these uh, Erasmus programs. Mm -hmm. It's a very small group of people who, as you mentioned yourself, benefit from this European idea. But if you really look deep, how can you have a demos without political uh, accountability? Uh, Europe doesn't dare to be a political institution. It's, it's this technocratic, complicated model that many people find interesting. Like the Euro African so what, Union so, is now so what, copying what, so what the European call, Union. So what would you call the European Parliament? Uh, the European Parliament is a complicated institution, sure. as it has been mentioned. It's, we cannot compare it so, and, uh, with national parliaments. So maybe not. The, maybe the European uh, uh, demos is this complexity, the way to work together in similarities. And I think the, the idea that you can be a European while you don't speak the same language, you, you don't share the same burden. Yeah, that's uh, now I sound like a nationalist, but I think we should be aware of this uh, critique. Okay, um, I'd like to thank you very much um, and uh, change panels, um, uh, but feel free to join in in the second half of the uh, of the conversation, please. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
most parliaments in the world, but it's deeply problematic as well at the same time, of course. But um, I was thinking out loud uh, by myself. But um, sorry about that. Um, um, I'd like to introduce the second panel, and uh, um, you've uh, listened to Simon Strauss already. Um, I've introduced him. Simon, uh, uh, a warm welcome to you again. And um, um, I'd like to introduce Bastian Rijpkema, who has been uh, often here in the Bali before. He's a legal philosopher and author of uh, and university lecturer at Leiden University. And um, uh, he co-wrote several uh, uh, publications on law and democracy and wrote a, a, a book on uh, uh, a democracy which is being translated at the moment into English. Yeah, I was so modest to keep the English edition there and not show it to you, but it's called Middle of Democracy. Well, well let's, let, let's um, just do that, because that's... that's <laughs> I a have a very good working <laughs> relationship with Yuri, as you see, so... <laughs> I even have both, so... This is, uh, this is the Dutch one. Yeah, and then the English one is below it, so... <laughs> no, yeah. it's not. Oh, it is! Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit yeah. hidden. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this. Militant Democracy, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's have it here, because that's... I mean, I think we couldn't encourage uh, writers and uh, authors enough to... Um, <laughs> but um, uh, um, uh, it just came out in Routledge, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, uh, and it, it's, uh, you, you're not actually working while well, you're thinking about this, uh, another book, but you're not actually working on it because it's such a success that it takes you so much time to explain what's in it <laughs> and, yeah. and tour the world that, that it takes you away from writing a second book. Isn't yeah, it? now I'm three years explaining my uh, book from 2015. Uh, but um, yeah, you're right. So the book came out in Dutch in 2015. And um, well, since 2015, there have, uh, have been a lot of issues connected, you could say, to democratic backsliding so the concept of how to defend democratic democracy. backsliding yeah, yeah so it's like the, the the general term for uh, democracies that are becoming less democratic less democratic yeah. so after no. 2015 or in 2015 you had the election of peace of course in poland uh, you have orban who is even getting more traction in hungary you had the election of trump of course all these uh, in turkey the referendum and the constitutional changes so all these developments are different and we have to uh, we should not too easily compare them, but there is a general sense that there is, of course, something happening in democracy. So the book from 2015 uh, yeah, is still something I'm quite busy with, and now there's also the English translation. Good, good. And I'd like to introduce Tamar de Waal. Um, she's a, a legal philosopher as well, a university lecturer at uh, the University of Amsterdam, and um, uh, Amsterdam Law School, actually, and she's a chair of the uh, uh, Fondation Civique, is that, mm -hmm. or should I say Foundation Civic? Both fine. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, your research focuses uh, a lot on migration and integration requirements, requirements for democratic citizenship. And um, um, uh, you're currently writing a book for uh, uh, the Bezige Bay, is that correct? Yes, so <laughs> I wrote an academic dissertation, obviously, but I'm now writing a uh, uh, the same book, not, not exactly the same book, but a more a accessible book, yeah, popular accessible. version of the dissertation, yes. And that's focusing on citizenship and, and or is it? Or is yes, it's about, it's, it, yeah, generally put, it's about um, mainstream political parties mm -hmm. try, uh, copying certain strategies and discourses on integration uh, from the uh, more anti-immigrant or populist parties uh -huh. that have counter productive effects uh, on these policies. They're becoming less, uh, uh, the, the policies actually become counterproductive. So instead of facilitating integration of newcomers, they're actually becoming a burden to them. But also I think they jeopardize equal citizenship in a broader sense. So uh, my main argument is actually that the mainstream parties should choose either to defend certain values or uh, core um, fundamental rights that people have in a liberal democracy, or they should not, uh, um, and then opt for these discourses, perhaps. Uh, but you can do both. So you would say that mainstream parties become an obstacle towards liberal democracy, in fact? Well, I think on these topics, yeah. they increasingly uh, are uh, shifting their discourses towards, um, um, if you fully uh, analyze these discourses, to uh, frameworks thinking about citizens with migrant backgrounds, citizens with, uh, without migrant backgrounds that are different and with that um, uh, jeopardizing the whole system 
and the promises that we have, like equal citizenship for all. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, uh, uh, I'm stressing the books you, the, the six of you are writing because um, because we're also uh, discussing um, and I'm in awe with it because and I'm really really happy that you take the time because it doesn't bring it takes a lot of time doesn't bring any income so it's wonderful that still some people are taking the uh, the length of trouble to uh, write down ideas and no, whether it be novels or non-fiction um, because also um, we, we, we have been discussing uh, in the panel earlier uh, uh, some of the problems of, of the European endeavor and maybe the top-down approach. And the, but I'm, I'm, I'm just more curious now on uh, what needs to be done. I mean, is it, is it um, and maybe, maybe I can uh, uh, start out with you, Bastian, um, um, because you're, you're, you're writing about militant democracy um, that has to do with the structures of democracy, but has a lot to do, of course, with the role uh, public intellectuals want to play in it, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And um, yeah, the the elites, if you want to call it that way, uh, in general. So um, intellectual elites, but also the politicians, of course, uh, uh, also from the European Union. I think I play a, a large role. And I one of my main frustrations is that um, we were talking today, actually, in uh, in our Arbeitsgruppe, um, the word I learned, uh, about um, the the European Union um, as a, uh, at least was one of uh, the things uh, in the end of the discussion of how you can bring the European Union as a future into the national uh, arena of democracy. And um, I think this is something that uh, gets off the rails every every election because in the in your own general election, so this is also a bit of a difference of opinion, I would say, with uh, Lawrence uh, of Fault, I would say the most influence you can exert on the European project is in your national elections. And um, I think one of the main topics at this time of national elections should be European topics. So I want to bring these European Union futures and debates on how the European Union should look to national parliaments. And this is a role uh, that... Uh, politicians, which I would call also part of the elite, but also intellectuals who sh should play. Um, and as I mentioned uh, today, uh, uh, Juncker is for my primary example. Juncker is not someone um, uh, I think people immediately would associate with uh, being the, the biggest visionary Democrat in the European Union. Um, of course, he gave us the right to set the clocks. Uh, it's a very important right that we now have, uh, that we don't have to change the clocks. But um, he did something that is serious from a democratic pers perspective, and that's that he wrote uh, with the European Commission, he made a white paper with five scenarios for where the European Union should go. Now we are left without uh, Great Britain. Um, and it was published f before the Dutch elections. Um, but it was not part of any debate, actually, in Dutch politics. Of course, these 66 uh, voiced their view of where the European Union should go. But there was no debate by the politicians, but also not by journalists or members of the intellectual elite that were not pressing politicians to um, choose which scenario do you want? Which scenario do you want of the five scenarios that Juncker laid down for you? Which way does Europe, uh, which way should Europe take? So I think this is a big problem and I think we should look for ways of bringing European futures to these national debates. Yeah. Uh-huh, but um, um, uh, they're not doing it. I mean, no. they have, there's a there's a white paper from Juncker, and there was yeah. um, I mean, I read it. There were several uh, scenarios in it which were, I mean, pretty yeah. visionary and extreme, even. I mean, yeah, like, but all uh, but not all options were on the table, but quite some but options. Quite some yeah. Of, yeah, I mean, yeah. almost like an entire I mean, a nation state project of making the European Union a state. Yeah, uh, that's one of the options. And the other one was, you know, uh, go, going back to sort of the e EEC model, the the European. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's pretty white. So, but 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 the net, I mean, a, a counter argument to you would be, I mean, there's this paper out of the Commission, and it's not being discussed in the national level. You know, no. they just don't want to talk about it. They want to have their national. Yeah, uh, but uh, I, I can understand why it is, this is the case, of course, because uh, our famous uh, 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 Mark Rutte, uh, without vision, uh, is it's his, uh, his catchphrase, um, he has not, nothing to gain with uh, saying, well, me and the Liberal Party are going for scenario D or something. Mm -hmm. um, there's no electoral gain there, but um, I think um, 
we as, as, as writers or as people in mm -hmm. public debate should press them on these issues and ask from them, okay, okay. Um, now that the elections, choose. choose that, the that's scenarios. what you see as a, a partly our role to press yeah. in public opinion about you know, what they really want, yeah. where they want to go. Yeah. yeah, because um, these national politicians that are now again blaming the European Union for all the things that are going wrong, mm -hmm. um, robbed, um, it's a bit of a strong word, but in a, in a certain sense they robbed the Dutch citizens in 2017 of a clear choice for where the European Union should go. Um, uh, because they didn't know. They didn't know on which party they should vote for which scenario. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, Tamara Waal, what you think, um, is, there, is there any role uh, left for um, public intellectuals? Is there, I mean, is there room? Are, are, are you being heard? Maybe you not personally, but, or maybe you are personally? Well, I think th th that uh, contains two questions, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a Several. role? Do yeah. you have a role? And mm -hmm. are you heard? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's definitely a role, and I would say that um, the thing that strikes me the most, because I've been participating in several public debates over the last few years, and that is when you discuss a certain topic, then you actually also give a lot of information that people don't know about. So when I discuss migration, for instance, and I discuss the refugee treaty, and I'm not discussing it as a good thing or a bad thing, people are actually surprised by that it exists. So people learn about the ref refugee convention when uh, refugees are entering the country. So I think that um, there is something wrong, at least in the Netherlands, I would be interested about how that in Germany is, but with our civic education about some of the core institutions and how it actually works, and it's without even saying that it should be supported or anything, but um, about how the liberal democratic state works, what a rule of law is, what international treaties are, why we entered them, what the historical circumstances were. Um, and I think that's really important because um, uh, in the Netherlands also, and I think a, a different European countries too, we applaud ourselves that we support democracy in high percentages. But at the same time, if you ask people, why do you support democracy? They answer freedom. Because they think democracy is freedom, freedom is good. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also why uh, the, the name of the uh, party of freedom is such a smart name, because people just think freedom is good. But actually, if you take the whole system of uh, the EU, of uh, the rule of law, of liberal democracy, it's quite a complex system, of course, that requires us to accept uh, division of powers and also a lot of things that are not allowed. So liberal democracy rule actually implies yeah. Yeah. a lot of unfreedom as well. Yeah. It's just yeah. a different configuration of politics. Yeah. It's not the same as freedom, as like just in abstracto. So in that sense, I think that um, uh, maybe our education failed us uh, in that sense. Um, I'm actually now working on a theory that um, there are different reasons why perhaps we have not focused enough on civic education over the last 60 years. Um, while we do think that we might all be supporters of liberal democracy, while like in, uh, if we really look upon what we then know and support, also with the Brexit, of course, did people really know where they were voting about? So the question, what do we support or what do we reject, is a shallow question if you do not really have the issues on the table, of course. So I think the role for public intellectuals is to also just give information and uh, emphasize that it's complex and that it's not that the questions mm -hmm. are difficult so the answer can also must also be difficult emphasize complexity yes and also give information about the complexity because you do not want to uh, uh, cre create a suggestion that it's complex and should therefore be uh, left to the elites or the experts that's not the, the point that I want to make the point is it is complex so we should all talk about all aspects of um, that's the an, system that's and what we want to defend or maybe reject, but let's have the discussion after we understand where we're talking about. That's a very interesting point you're making, and um, a, a complex one, which makes sense because you're arguing for complexity. And, um, but um, if, we, if public intellectuals um, uh, should explain more the complexity of things and the, that some things are deeper or less easy to solve or, or older or <laughs> um, um, than it seems, um, then you would 
you might argue that it's a good idea to leave it to, um, to the experts and uh, uh, to the people who are in charge of it. And, and, you, and to take that argument a little bit further, um, one of the real problematic things, I think, about populist movements is that they question every authority, even mm -hmm. academic authority or, um, uh, or judges, or Berlusconi is very good at that, you know, uh, saying that Toga Rossa, that, that all the judges were you know, um, members of the Communist Party, or so it's um, so that's uh, yeah. How which way would you argue? Would you? Well, I think uh, um, political issues are complex, but at the same time, they're not rocket science. So if they're too complex to be discussed, there's something wrong with um, how it is approached. Um, and I think that one of the problems that uh, European um, public intellectuals, or maybe, I don't really like the word elite, but we're working with it tonight, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the problems is that in Europe, it was long um, because the Second World War happened and there were a lot of topics you could just not discuss or mention. Uh, and you also see that, for instance, there is now this famous interview with Jordan Peterson with a BBC uh, journalist, I believe. Yeah, I think she was a, from a private or Channel system, 4, but maybe. Yeah, but, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was a good example that um, I think the intellectuals also should equip themselves with better arguments why they are actually defending certain institutions, values, ideas. Sort of, yeah. Because her main reaction to him was, how can you say that? Yeah, outrage. How, so yeah, outrage. How, yeah, how dare yeah. you to say that? Yeah. Um, and I think that um, emotional reaction is not enough anymore. No. So uh, John and that's Stewart, a good, and that's a good thing, you would argue. Well, or, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or no, bad. Oh, well, no, maybe. No, I mean, no. uh, John Stuart Mill said we have to discuss and discuss topics over and over again, also because we want to know why we support certain things. Yeah. So to remember the main reasons for how we, what we find important, we have also to open up the debate about them all the time. So in that sense, I do think it's important that if you want to have um, certain fundamental rights in the EU, you think those are European or EU uh, values, uh, um, you have to know why you support them. It's not only about this is just how they are and you're a bad person if you reject them. So I think that, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we have to reassess all these arguments again and really have to debate about them again. But that also requires knowledge, information about history, about the current system, also the problems with the current system. So that's system. the chance for progress the nationalists put to the public debate, actually. Is that the way of putting it, or is that yes, too positive? Yes, and I would say they make it simple, yeah. mm -hmm. um, too simple. And I, but I actually also believe that um, people at the end of the day also know that it, it cannot be that simple, and that mm -hmm. more complex stories, well-informed and um, also driven. So in that sense, I also believe that uh, we really have to stand for these um, ideals, like mm -hmm. the book you mentioned. Uh, it's, of course, also a... Julien Benda, you mean? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's also about we have... Says, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It, there's something at stake here. Mm -hmm. So that sense of urgency is actually required in this sense. Okay, and, 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 and coming back to the other part of the question, um, uh, being, um, would that be also in the end in pr being in praise of authority and of elites who lead these democratic institutions or processes, or would that go, would you say that goes too far? In praise? Well, um, uh, the, the, the conversation we're just having, uh, would, you, would you end up by concluding that it's, is, is it, let's, put it, let's phrase it differently, is it problematic that Populist movements question all these authorities and, and, and undermine them. As such, I don't think it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you have certain discourses that are just um, uh, undermining and toxic that can become problematic. Mm -hmm. But just raising questions about how things are currently set up is, as such, I think, not the problem, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I might be very old-fashioned, but I think it's deeply troubling in a way that um, that you question the authorities of uh, professors on their topic or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't bring another argument, of course, and bringing uh, f founded arguments is always very good, and it's a chance to 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 think to rethink your arguments. Absolutely. Um, on the other hand, I think it might be deeply problematic because um, a governor of a continent is elitist. 
Yeah. I mean, there's no other way around it. I mean, there's one commissioner or 10 or 15 or, but on, and it's, uh, and parliamentarians are elected and it's an elite. Yeah. Know? Well, we should discuss these separate, separate um, sure. examples, I'm, of I'm course, bundling it but at the same now. time, yeah. I think yeah. it would also be unattractive yeah. if university professors were always believed no matter what. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm saying that yeah. as somebody <laughs> no, who works sure. at a university. Yeah. <laughs> so there is, of course, a debate also in that sense, yeah. Absolutely. Simon, um, 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 uh, would, you, would you say that, um, that your generation has a role to play other than, than my generation, for instance, like I started off, um, to start um, talking about Europe in a different way or in a... Yeah, I, mean, I would say we will have a hard time to actually fight for liberal values because we are born into a world of liberal liberalization. So we are already born into a liberal world, also the mar not only the markets but also the morals are more liberal than even in your generation and looking at, at the older generation it was even more anti-liberal. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say this is, um, this is really a, a problem also. How can you, how can you find um, your fight basically? <clears throat> so I, and I really think we have to, to look um, maybe very humbly first and foremost of what are the interests of our generation? So questioning the demographical problems as well. And are there maybe problems in a, in a European generation where so many old people take uh, so much um, responsibility and so many, uh, so many voting power, for example, you know? What is about, I mean, I always think about the huge problem of youth unemployment in the South. I mean, this is really a lost generation. Right now, in this moment, 2019, there are people, a lot of people of my age, uh, who don't have um, at all the uh, the privilege to be to call themselves an intellectual elite because they just still live at the home with their parents. They don't yeah, have. Yeah, you're talking about Spain or Italy or. No. Yeah, I mm -hmm. mean it's where we go for holidays. Yeah, yeah. we go to yeah, holidays right. to. I mean we go to holidays to Greece and Italy and Spain. And uh, I sometimes look in the faces of, uh, and I met people there. You know, authors, writers in Italy who can't really pay for their rent. Europe, 2019. And so what is what what could there be? Um, uh, could there be somehow a political um, aim to kind of focus on these issues as well, to make age a political program? You know, I mean, I know that this can't be taken too far, but I don't see at the moment any young politician who's boldly defending the right of my generation. Actually, in Holland, we see the opposite. We see a flourishing uh, party for people above 50. Exactly. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I mean, you can see a little bit. That's why, that's why I, I mean... I don't really know enough to, to evaluate it, but I mean, this climate change movement now, led by a 16-year-old uh, schoolgirl, basically, it's an interesting moment, you know? I mean, we don't have to, it's probably not as complex as a, a, a professor would talk about it, but it's, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's a signal and it's a symbol, and politics lives also from symbols. And I always thought, for example, after the Brexit vote, I always had the feeling Juncker should have stepped down because it was such a defeat for why, him. Why would he? Yeah, because why, it was a, not because he's like a bad guy or it's like a, but it's like a symbol. It would have been a symbol. Okay, we understood that it's not going to work like this, you know. And I mean, sometimes I think, you know, we have to think a bit more about um, about the symbolization of politics and to yeah. to get more like young politicians um, in, in 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 terms of power or to speak up a little bit more. Um, to 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 yeah to tackle these qu these problems we have because obviously we have problems uh, we will ha face problems um, not only economic problems with the pensions and the rise of uh, you know capital just in uh, older generations and but it's also like I said it's about it, youth it, employment it's, it's and it's an interesting point about Juncker and I entirely agree with you um, um, uh, uh, I was outraged that he didn't step down I mean, yeah, I mean um, if if a country which fought on the European continent twice to uh, 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 to uh, to have a free continent uh, 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 voluntarily breaks away, that's such an outcry for the U mm. Commission right. that he should have stepped down, I think, yeah. personally. But did you write that down? Did you write an opinion article on that? No, well, I mean, I wrote an article, not uh, specifically not, not, on not this, just but to I mean, put you on the spot, but I'm just wondering yeah, you know, yeah. about his role on, you know... No. Yeah, no, I haven't done it so far, mm -hmm. but I mean, I would say it's very interesting if you talk about Europe also in terms of how many... Uh, young representatives. For instance, I didn't, and I regret the fact that yeah. I didn't. I yeah. should think yeah. I should have. I should yeah. have written, written an opinion something. piece yeah. no, about this. Well, but yeah. 
Yeah, um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, trying to dig in my memory if I did such a thing. I'm afraid that I only wrote an opinion piece in praise of Juncker uh, for well, his well, five you scenarios. Have very, you yeah, have a very good point about... But it's interesting because um, I was hoping actually that the Brexit um, would lead to some process of self-reflection within the European Union. So that when Brexit happened, that um, the European Union would think, okay, well, um, now we lost, as Yuri rightly stressed, a very important partner of the European, uh, well, uh, important member of the European Union and a future, uh, I hope, partner of the European Union. Um, so. How are we going to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future? How are we going to make, great point, uh, Lawrence also made, uh, our political process more transparent uh, and uh, make the European Union as it is now function better? But to my regret, uh, the reaction uh, of the European Commission is, yeah, n except for this great white paper I uh, praised, uh, is that, uh, well, okay, uh, he had a State of the Union where he said, well, the, I think it was a year or so after Brexit, uh, the wind is in our sails, so he had some kind of uh, metaphor, so he tried to appeal to his public. Uh, so this is a really strange reaction, and the other thing they did, is that they like revived the enlargement agenda, and for me it was incomprehensible. So we are, we so the Brits are at the exit, and then we say, ah, well, we have some new guys. So now we are down from 28 to 27. Let's enlarge to 31. While in the European Union at the moment we have a great divide between East and European, Eastern European and Western European and member you, states. And do you feel that you want to be part of a discussion about first things first? Um, so first, before before we go to Ukraine or uh, the Western Balkans or Albania, yeah. we solve the problems with the Visegrad Four. Yeah, is that uh, what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this, and I can. Uh, what well, do you want to be part of that public debate? Yeah, I want to. Yeah, but should, should we have a <laughs> European public debate on that? Well, uh, a European public debate would be good, uh, and I'm happy to say that I did write an article on this issue. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, it's a very good day. Yeah. Um, so I did uh, write this this, this 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 stance that well, okay, before we enlarge, let's fix our rule of law issues within the European Union first. Uh, in the academic literature, you have this very funny uh, term that's called post-accession hooliganism. So you get in the European Union, and then the mechanisms to get a uh, democratically backsliding state back into like the liberal democratic sphere, the mechanisms are not that great. So um, maybe we should fix those issues before we try to... You can't to, do uh, anything about uh, yeah. Kaczynski firing... Well, you can do uh, something, but... Um, his, his judges, and yeah, yeah but not enough, you're saying. No, the, yeah. So the union should be more, should, uh, uh, be more equipped to... Yeah, so I think... Uh, to, to, well, to implement the rule of law in its member states. Yeah, it's a bit of a dangerous question because now I can roll out a whole program for what we should do. But uh, one suggestion then, I think, and it's also been discussed a lot lately, that um, instead of using this uh, very nuclear Article 7 option, eh, Article 7 of the European Union Treaty makes it possible to like suspend a member state yeah. from certain rights. That, that's the sort of nuclear option. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's also unusable because uh, there's a veto option, so Poland and Hungary already said we are going to veto uh, if you try to start it against one of the countries. So that's not really a good option, but you should do something about the subsidies. Uh, mm. The point was stressed already in the, the panel before. Yeah. Uh, Orban um, is, and Hungary is one of the biggest, maybe even the biggest, netto receivers, net receivers of European Union money. Um, and he can build his illiberal democracy in part funded by the European Union. So yeah. this, I would, be, would say... Same is, is true for Nigel Farage, of course. <laughs> For instance, but uh, yeah. uh, we have a bigger problem in Hungary, I would say. Yeah, I would say. Uh, well, yeah, well, well. anyway, Great Britain, leaving, is, so. Great Britain is still a big problem, but yeah, but 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 yes, and I see your point. So 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 actually, um, let's be clear about this. Have our actually all three of you are saying, be very clear about the institutions and the democratic foundations of these institutions, mm -hmm. and be bold about it. Is that mm -hmm. can I sort of summarize that up? Be be more aware of it and bold and and bolden and bold them, mm -hmm. give them more power, maybe even. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would say even be aware how what the protection 
uh, of these institutions could be for, for the individual as mm -hmm. well. I mean, um, the protection, the justice uh, question, the security question, and all possible uh, meanings, but, but also... But that would be against the wishes of a lot of yellow vests, and we are very elitist here, aren't we? Well, that is the, that's why we, we said you know, the our unions... You prime, prime minister said we are all a yellow vest, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, and Berlin is probably, but... <laughs> No, but I mean, it would be interesting. I mean, why, why, why is it against the Yellow Vest to, to, to argue for a Europe-wide um, workers' regulation, you know, to give the same security standards for all workers in Europe? I mean, that's why we said not only uh, a Europe of companies, but a Europe of workers. And why yeah. is there not a, you know, a union um, a community, a European Union community? And there is. There is a European... But I mean, why don't they uh, have a voice in all of this as well, you know? I would personally agree with you, but you could frame it, of course, that, you know, strengthen the powers of the unions or, or making, um, or making uh, unions legal in part of the union um, because they are, um, or organized unions, for instance, I th to come back to Orban, one of the problems there is that Hungarians work for wages which are outrageous if you compare them to the Germans. And they do the same thing because they build the p spare parts of the cars who are you know, shipped off a few hundred kilometers and then you, and the workers there um, uh, have organized themselves better through their workers unions. So have workers unions in Hungary raised the salary of them? And Orban would be in trouble if he, he would, you know. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of that, of course. But then you have to explain it better than only about our institutions and how nice they are, maybe. I mean, we should use, I think we should really use um, the power we have in, in Europe. And obviously there is, the parliament doesn't have that much power, but maybe that's a problem and we should address the problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should make the parliament stronger, for example, in changing the way of, um, of how we deal with uh, countries who openly declare that they are anti-EU, you know, and that they don't want to share, to, to take the share, but they want to get the money, but they don't want to help solving the migration problems. I mean, why is that happening? No, how can I explain that to my children, basically? Yeah? How can we accept uh, that this is happening? You know, we, 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 we just say, yeah, it is like this, and uh, uh, Poland um, is completely benefiting from the European um, uh, money, and it's, and it's project, now a yeah. very, very powerful country because of the EU. I mean, it's incredibly uh, what, what this country has made, changed. 20 years ago, uh, all the Polish people went to work in Germany. Now the Germans want to work in Poland because it's such a great economic start up a system there whatever i mean why, why why is that happening you know how how can you explain this injustice in terms of okay we benefit but we don't want to help solving uh, this issue because obviously if everyone would have a feeling of responsibility in these questions then we uh, we would talk differently about the we would still have a, obviously a problem but it would be a different uh, scale of, uh, of of our problem so i really think uh, yeah i mean the 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 aim of of, of the younger generation is not to just um, preserve and say it's, um, it's, it's very good to, pr uh, to protect uh, the European institutions against the uh, Trumpist uh, um, 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 populace, but it's also um, not to be afraid of asking for a, a stronger, like a a stronger um, a change uh, in these kind of uh, parliamentary uh, debates and the parliamentary strength. And uh, in the end, I think this will, will uh, then lead to a kind of a European feeling in the end, you know? And, um, I mean, I like the way you said Afro-European uh, as, as an identity yeah. thing. I mean, this is really something, you know, we can only feel that if we have the feeling that it's working justicely. I mean, there's a justice in the back of it, you know, and then uh, we will get the feeling as well. Bastian? Uh, no, maybe one short response is uh, on the migration um, issue combined with the, with, with the subsidies. Uh, I would really want to disentangle both. So I think one of the, I think the strategic mistakes of the European Commission and of uh, our guy in Europe, Timmermans, is that in his uh, confrontation with Orban, uh, for instance, he is not only pushing on the rule of law issue, but also combining this with the migration issue. And I think, of course, uh, we can have all kinds of opinions on migration. It's a different uh, and uh, how much migration the European Union should have and how migration should be uh, dispersed over the European Union. And I think this is a genuine political issue, but you should disentangle it from the, the, more, rule, the, the rule, rule of law uh, issue, which is not at least in the same sense a political issue. And the problem is that if you combine both in your confrontation with Orban, 
as Timmermans did, then you do exactly what Orban wants. Because Orban um, doesn't want to say to his country, well, okay, I'm abolishing the rule of law a bit, but and they don't like it in Brussels. He wants to say, uh, they want to force migration quota on us, and that's why they are trying to get sanctions against us. So, so you're you help playing him by his book, actually. You, so you yeah. help him with you his national arguments. You keep the political mm -hmm. issues apart from these rule of law issues. Sorry. Yeah, well, just to respond uh, to quickly point, to this yeah. point, is, yeah, it's of course, I agree that this should be the case, but at the same time, as soon as refugees enter Europe, it's becoming a rule of law issue, right? Because then they immediately have rights and they are not easily sent back. So in that sense, um, I think that, um, well, the Refugee Convention basically gives uh, some status to everybody who enters the country and has a right to this asylum uh, yeah, status. So there is, I think, a deeper problem there with the issue of migration and how to disentangle it from the rule of law issues. But that was actually not the point that I wanted to make, because um, uh, I think that one of the main uh, challenges today is also to explain that there is this vision of what Europe is, that you have the nation state and then above that there is the EU, mm -hmm. but that you could easily break it off and then you have the nation state again. But actually how the EU and EU law works, it's it's not as if it's above it as some it's kind of heaven, it. yeah. it's heavily in it. Yeah. Um, uh, That's what you see with the Brexit now, for instance. Yes, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. the, uh, we should not forget that uh, the UK was actually not as much in it as, for instance, the Netherlands is. Like, they were not in Schengen, they were not in the Euro. Um, so, if it, if you, it, it must be even easier for them to leave the EU than it would be for, that's for actually, instance, that's the That's Netherlands. actually a very interesting point. You're saying the metaphor is wrong. It's not above. No, it's in yeah. it. It's, it's just factually not how the EU mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think we should also disentangle that myth and also explain that if you criticize something, it's not always about leaving it, right? So, for instance, you can criticize the Netherlands on a lot of topics. Uh, Dutch politics, you can disagree with basically, basically everything that says. But then the discussion is not about whether you want to be in the Netherlands as a state or not, right? So this, this different That's debate about the EU as some sort of loose entity, I think... Mm -hmm. um, it's a wrong metaphor. It might... Yeah, it might upset people because they have the feeling that after the Second World War they were lured into this EU project mm. and they thought they could always leave. No, they made but it. You're saying yeah, that yeah, it's, it's they themselves. Yeah, yeah in, 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 in a way. And it's, yeah, it's, so it's if, if you leave it, it means reforming the Netherlands and not having it back. Yes. For instance. So, yeah, yeah so I, I think yeah. that we should bend the debate towards criticizing certain parts of the EU and we can heavily disagree about whether the EU is good or functions or what parts mm -hmm. of the EU are valuable and not. But I would like it to shift away from uh, the existential discussion about do we want to be in this because it's it more implies complex actually than, than <laughs> that. Uh, yes or no, in or out. Yeah. yeah. One mm -hmm. one small point, of course. Last point. Uh, yeah, very small because very small. two legal philosophers together. So um, I would say that um, <laughs> I think one one attempt to disentangle it is that there is a difference between migrant rights or the rights of refugees ah, and, you're the you're the point and, and the political and the political <laughs> decision to to uh, have migration quota because this yeah, was the I'm case. Belly yeah. for for Orban, and this is a political decision. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, maybe I am uh, maybe I'm in favor of these quota, but this is a different issue than a rule of law issue. I think so, you both yeah. agree actually on that <laughs> point, but but, yeah. but there's comp uh, yeah, but it's a slightly different topic. and and no. and actually a, a specialized one for and, and very interesting <laughs> one. But um, um, I'm drawing too close uh, uh, here. I'm looking at other people who um, are uh, wanting to comment or come in or or say anything, or um, 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 might be willing to... Yep, you over there, I, I, I come to you with the microphone. Because there are people at home who couldn't hear you otherwise. Thank you, my name is Stan. Um, I've always learned that the principle of mutual trust between member states is one of the pillars of the European <laughs> Union. Um, do you think that principle still holds when we see the situation in Hungary, for example? Or should we go from the principle of uh, trust is good, but control is better? Mm. Good point. Yeah. Is there anybody who offers to, volunteers to yeah. think about that? Well, um, 
Yes, I would say that a lot of things in the European Union are based on this premise, of course. And also, I would say the new rule of law framework that's since 2014 in, uh, in, uh, in place that is really based on this idea of uh, having uh, talks together and discussing all these kinds of rule of law issues and then by like yeah, almost some kind of peer review uh, by uh, legal uh, uh, employees in the different countries, then uh, we can fix these issues. And I think to a certain extent this has worked for some issues in the European Union, but I think, um, well, in the end there are now two countries where there's um, they are making a start with the Article 7 uh, procedure, so that also signals that the like the, the conference route uh, of having these discussions did not uh, work out for for making a real change. And I do not advocate that we are going to do the whole Article 7 run. I don't think it's going to work in the end. But I think you could, in some way, um, make a connection between rule of law uh, after such a discussions with peers and how you uh, perform on this rule of law indicators and the budget of the EU. So I think that's our best guess, or best try, I should say, at this moment, to do something on the rule of law issue in the European Union. Yeah. Yep. When uh, Lawrence was asked in the first half um, from you, if there's a demos, you replied very quickly. And what struck me quite a bit was how quickly you, you replied. Because it seems to be, for, to me, a huge premise to think that there is something like a demos. There are philosophers like Jacques Rancière who, says, who say um, the demos, they are the uncounted, they are the disenfranchised. And we have people here in the room who are writing books about becoming a Dutchman. And on this basis, I would like to ask, I would like to ask if your discussion shouldn't be a bit more strategic, a bit more focused on, for example, theories like a left populism, for example, and not just on solidifying or cultivating or cultivating something that seems to be given, but in my eyes, isn't given. Isn't given. Isn't what? Isn't given. No, you, you care to comment? <laughs> no, I, I fully agree. Uh, but, uh, in the sense that uh, I responded rather quick because I thought you were, uh, were going to ask about the democracy instead of the demos. And um, um, I think one of the things that we try to achieve with Volt is really uh, involve people on the local level, um, and also within that respect, of course, want to show what Europe is also doing for them, but also listening, of course, or to what their problems are, because I also think. That is where it all starts, uh, by listening to others instead of proclaiming what you uh, think is your vision. I thought you, and I think you have the last question. <laughs> so, um, Bastian, um, you were saying that you were surprised that uh, nothing changed or there were not a really a kick off of a big discussion after the Brexit. and. Uh, also to the other people uh, that's, that were speaking before. Yeah, you, you have some plan of what to change, what to improve, the parliament and uh, other things. But don't you think that uh, it has been like that for a long time and it will not change because of uh, the unanimity uh, of the treaty? So if you want to change a single word, you need to have everybody <laughs> to agree. And I'm afraid that any change will never happen and uh, that the only solution is to leave. Ah. Um, okay, to, uh, to have a more uh, optimistic perspective, <laughs> uh, at least I try, um, and otherwise I have another chance at the bar uh, after the debate. But, uh, well, I would say that um, without changing the treaties, the, the, only, the only change or the only different attitude I propose is that the national politicians uh, make clearer in national elections what their stances on the European Union are. And in the end, the, the, the national governments are the, the governments that are deciding the big issues in the European Union. Of course, the European Par Parliament is, is important, but the real decisions are made f from a Dutch perspective by Rutte and his colleagues. And um, knowing what kind of future of the European Union they uh, see and they want to fight for, I think is a very uh, 
important change and a change uh, in European politics, bringing European politics really to the national political arena without any change to treaties. So I hope this is uh, bringing a bit of optimism to your uh, side. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm closing um, now, um, uh, saying a few words maybe, but um, um, thanking you all very, very much for being here and uh, participating. And um, I have to say, I'm really optimistically in awe about you six people and about the initiative um, uh, the Arbeit on Europe does. Um, I'm very, very happy that you came over to Amsterdam and mm -hmm. that you people did and uh, that we organized this workshop today. And I'm in awe of all six of you. Um, the way I see it, um, we might consider, I've been always very critical about the baby boom generation, the heavy, most heavily subsidized generation in the history of mankind. Uh, but um, now that I look at my own generation, who, uh, is, who you can and could and should maybe um, um, uh, describe as a generation of uh, 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 hangers on, who um, uh, just, you know, um, um, uh, just, just, just by their fingernails, at the tips of their fingers, hangs on to what is being constructed by the baby, baby boom generation, the generation before that, which could have been described as the greatest generation ever lived, the one who won the Second World War, but and established uh, the world after that, after that catastrophe. Um, my generation just hangs on and um, has, has is sort of um, sort of tone deaf to anything intellectual and looking forwards. I would say, in many respects, and so if I listen to you. Uh, uh, six people um, uh, around 30 writing books and uh, uh, banging out ideas about you know what uh, a society should be like if you look at the history of ideas um, most ideas which changed the world were written down by people who were around 28 years old or developed by people who are 28 years old. <laughs> so um, a little bit over that, that's sort of the average of it. And there's a little bit, so um, so the things you just think out uh, might really change the world. And I think it's about time you um, you uh, um, uh, get to, to, to the point you're really doing that. And it looks like you are. So thank you very, thank you very much for thinking out loud and for, for being here and organizing something like a European uh, uh, debate uh, on these sort of things. Um, I think, uh, by the way, that um, a demos is a construct. Benedict Anderson has proven that, you know, um, uh, in a very, very obvious way. You can construct um, uh, any demos you'd like. You can put uh, uh, French people together, and you think you can people put you can put people together who are as different as Bretagne, Languedoc, uh, Gascogne, and the Ile-de-France, and make it into Frenchmen. You can uh, easily have a myth of common descent about European history. In, in my view, the whole idea of the nation state is superimposed of what we have underneath it is the European demos because it's always been there for a very, very long time. It's much more ancient, much older than all this new sort of paint on it by a romantic nationalist, which we just should scrap off and find the European demos. But that's my personal idea. Okay, thank you very much. And we, there's a bar here. <laughs>